So we are at Van Whiskey, and we're going to be talking about the accelerated aging of whiskey. I'm Abby. I'm Sam. I'm Sean. I'm Brooke. So the mission statement of Rip Van Whiskey is to lower the production and therefore consumer cost uh, of aged whiskey through the utilization of an industrial scale uh, accelerated aging process. So how whiskey is traditionally aged by uh, other um, whiskey distillers is you place the distillate of your uh, fermentation process into an oak barrel. Uh, and you let it sit there for however many years that you decide. Uh, and the fluctuations in the temperature and pressure of the whiskey will actually drive the uh, distillate in and out of the pores of the barrel, since wood is porous. And it'll extract uh, a lot of organic compounds that uh, lend you know, that whiskey flavor that I'm sure we're familiar with. Um, uh, it extracts it uh, from the wood into the whiskey. And this is obviously Obviously, you know, you go to uh, your top shelf brands that can be very expensive uh, because of the costs uh, that are associated with this process. Uh, an oak barrel on its own costs about $1,000, and to age it for 30 years, uh, the associated cost of maintaining that barrel, uh, including labor or, you know, when your whiskey uh, evaporates off, switching it to a smaller barrel, it'll all add up over 30 years to about $4,500. Um, so it's uh, the materials are expensive. Um, the labor involved is, you know, a, a barrel is, will hold about 40 liters, or 40 gallons rather, uh, and, you know, Jack Daniels produces about a million gallons of whiskey a year, so you can imagine the amount of barrels they go through. Um, and then uh, the intrinsic uh, property that makes uh, aged whiskey so rare is that as you age whiskey, about 2% of it uh, every year evaporates off and that's called the angel share in the industry uh, but what it really means is that you lose product as time goes on um, and so you end up you know that's why it, it drives the cost up uh, so traditional aging has benefits obviously that's why people do it um, <laughs> So uh, you have your lactones, phenolic compounds, aldehydes, esters, and other compounds. Um, uh, your lactones will have uh, kind of the woody flavor um, of your oak. Phenolic compounds are smoky. Uh, aldehydes are kind of the, your spicier compounds. Uh, esters are fruity. Uh, and other compounds can kind of be like that buttery caramel flavor. Um, and so it's a very complex molecular structure of whiskey. Um, and in addition, over the 30 years that a barrel will age, uh, it ends up lending itself to, some people describe it as an architecture of the whiskey. And so it's a very tricky process to you know, speed up in like a sunny afternoon. Uh, but people try and do it anyway. Uh, so uh, the alternatives, uh, there are, we're not the first people to try and uh, age whiskey faster. Uh, so uh, a lot of distillers uh, around the country will actually use uh, just soaking their whiskey in wood chips uh, to have more surface area in contact with oak. And this is uh, supposed to, um, you know, at normal temperature, normal pressure, uh, this is supposed to draw out more of the distillate, or draw more of the compounds into the distillate. Um, then uh, in San Francisco, there's a company called Endless West. Uh, and they actually blend their whiskey from like the ground up. They'll uh, extract compounds from oak and then add that to a neutral uh, ethanol solution. Uh, but this uh, doesn't lend itself to like the architecture that I mentioned. It's more, it's, it's just not as complex. Um, then uh, there's uh, in Kentucky this, com uh, this company called Terracentia Corporation uh, uses uh, ultrasonic wave aging. Uh, this is supposed to agitate the whiskey and add energy to the system. Uh, Lost Souls, with uh, another company, uh, uses light instead, and the added energy is supposed to galvanize certain reactions. Um, since a lot of uh, since some phenolic compounds uh, are, you know, you extract some from the wood, but some of them are actually made from the chemical reaction. Um, the reduction of ethanol to ethyl acetate uh, is a flavor compound, or lignin. Uh, extracted from wood reacts to form vanillin, uh, and so these seek to kind of finish those incomplete reactions. 
Um, then uh, other companies will use uh, sort of a barrel treatment where it's less about the whiskey and more about the oak itself, uh, where they will use a highly pressured environment to force the whiskey into the, into the oak and then use an oxygenated, oxygenated environment to foment those reactions while it's still um, in contact with the oak. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, the Jefferson Corporation, which uses uh, ocean aging, they call it, uh, which is to uh, put their barrels uh, on top of a tanker uh, and just set it out to sea to drift for however many years. And this is supposedly uh, going to uh, cut down on the aging process, make it faster. Uh, but, I mean, you have the costs normally associated with the barrel, but then you also have to have that barrel out on the ocean, uh, which is exorbitantly expensive. Um, and then the Lincoln County process is practiced by several distillers, uh, and uh, it's actually legally required uh, to call it Tennessee whiskey. Uh, and this is the method of charcoal mellowing, which is basically you put it through uh, charcoal, which not only does it flavor the whiskey in a way, but it also filters the whiskey um, and uh, changes around some of the compounds in there for that Tennessee whiskey taste. Uh, yeah. So uh, basically for our basic uh, case design, so our feed in would be a ethanol water solution, an ethanol water, an ethanol water solution that, um, that would be uh, pumped at about 20 bars into a heat exchanger which raises the mixture temperature to about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's passed through a PBR into a holding tank. Inside the PBR, uh, there are wood chips which are uh, which are finely grinded and also uh, toasted. So within the, the wood chips would hold some phenol compounds that will be extracted through this uh, while you force uh, the mixture and with high pressure and high temperature. Also there is a reaction with uh, lignin which is in the wood and the ethanol to give uh, vanillin and also there is a reaction with oxygen and ethanol which gives you ethylastic. So these two compounds as well as the phenol compounds uh, give the whiskey the aroma and the taste that uh, each whiskey would have. So for our base case uh, business plan, what it is is that now like there's not a lot of uh, whiskey aging uh, industry, so it is not saturated. So what, what we do is that we would sell our intellectual property, <coughs> which is our design, to other companies. We would target these companies by doing targeted ads uh, then uh, once we uh, contact with them and we work with them by word of mouth, we would also be contacted to other distilleries in order to work for them. And also we would have a website where we engage our clients, which are the distilleries. Uh, so uh, on top of that, our, our, our process is scalable because it, uh, it is just an intellectual property. So it could be scalable to different kind of um, so different size of distilleries. Also, it could also be used in different uh, spirits than um, than whiskey. All, all we have to do is swipe up the the oak chips, uh, which the oak wood chips with other uh, plant material that is specific to the certain spirit. So then we would have to probably adjust the, the pressure and the temperature uh, depending on uh, the desired. Um, uh, the desired spirit that we're trying to uh, each. So uh, before we can actually proceed with creating a real business based on this, we need to do some testing. Um, and uh, we decided that it would be necessary to create a bench top scale model of our prototype in order to uh, primarily determine the ratio of wood chips to the um, uh, alcohol solution and to determine if there was any um, alcohol evaporation during uh, the process while it ran. Um, bottom here, you can actually see a sample of uh, some of the um, samples we made. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, to create this process uh, under budget and on time, we needed to find a device that replicated or was similar to the uh, process that we had designed. And we found this in a uh, simple espresso machine. It has many components that are very similar to the stuff in our full size process. We have a small but very powerful pump a uh, nice little heating element and a storage tank and a uh, extraction chamber um, or which replicates the uh, pack bed reactor. Um, 
So uh, we found this uh, Gaja Espresso. Um, this thing is from the uh, late 90s, I believe. Um, we took it apart. We uh, added a um, thermistor to measure temperature connected to an Arduino. We um, changed the uh, power going to the heating elements to make it safer and reduce temperature. Um, we uh, were able to get this device to operate at a flow rate of about 9 milliliters per second. Um, temperature a little less than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and um, we would use about eight grams of wood chip per uh, pass through. Uh, the way we would, no, one second, the way we would operate it would be we um, would uh, take uh, samples uh, in 10 second increments um, to measure the uh, difference in the compounds extracted as time progresses during the extraction run. So obviously safety was a pretty serious concern when we were building this thing. We have um, high pressure and uh, potential for high temperature near um, the ethanol, which could create an explosion, um, and we did not want that. So to mitigate risk, we did two things. We had the uh, aforementioned uh, thermistor installed. Um, if you're not familiar with what a thermistor is, it's a passive electronic device that um, has resistance, which decreases as temperature uh, increases. So we calibrated that to a uh, curve and um, using that along with an Arduino to uh, measure and record the temperature of the device so we could shut it off if um, it got too hot. Um, we also uh, modified the heating elements in the boiler of the espresso machine. Um, so initially there were two. We disconnected one of them entirely. Uh, we also reduced the voltage significantly to it. Um, it originally got mains voltage from 120 volts AC. We stepped that down all the way to 30 volts AC. Um, which dropped the power from, initially it was uh, dissipating 1.2 kilowatts of heat into the boiler and when it was functioning as an espresso machine, now it's only dissipating about 30 watts. So it's much safer, the ramp up time for the heat is a lot lower and the steady state temperature is um, much lower too, although we don't try to reach that point regardless. So in terms of analyzing the data that was gathered from our experimentation, um, just a qualitative look at our samples, um, the sample on the left being the sample that came from the first 10 seconds of our, our run, and the sample on the furthest right being the last 10 seconds, um, it's pretty clear that there's a color gradient across the samples. Our process stream was initially clear, so there is a pretty significant um, difference and it does suggest there's a rate of um, depletion of the wood. So to analyze these results further, um, we opted to go use UV spectroscopy um, with the Thermoscientific Genesis 10S spectrometer. Um, we used a one centimeter cuvette and used our 40% um, ethanol solution as our baseline. So this is what our absorbance curve looked like. The um, blue line on the top represents um, our sample taken from zero to 10 seconds of time. Um, and the bottom most line represents our last um, set of data taken, um, and again, this suggests that there was a rate of depletion in the wood. So what does this mean um, when compared with industry standards? So this here is our data that we generated. Um, the scales just changed a little bit to be comparable to the industry data. Um, and then this figure is from Brewing and Distilling Analytical Services. Um, they ran several different types of um, spirits uh, through a UV spec. Um, and this is the um, data that they got. You can see that their middle line range here, this brown line, pink line, and green line, most closely re um, resemble what we get in terms of absorbance and curve shape. Um, all three of those are representative of four, or three different um, types of bourbon whiskey. This would make sense with uh, our process because bourbon whiskey is produced um, in new charred new oak barrels, um, which is similar to the type of wood chip that we used in our process. The other thing we needed to determine from this um, experimental uh, analysis is whether or not our um, final product resembled something that had been aged. So this is again another study done by Brewing and Distilling Analytical Services. Um, the red line represents an aged spirit, um, while the um, blue and brown lines represent unaged spirits. Um, and again, our data closely resembles these both in absorbance level and curve shape. So then the last thing that we needed to determine from this was um, the ratio that we wanted to use of wood to distillate in our process. Um, so comparing this to another study that this time was done by Diego, which um, is the parent company responsible for producing um, 
brands like Tangeray and Johnny Walker. Uh, we compared our data to five um, different whiskey samples. Um, the, they didn't specify which brands that they were, but they're all five different brands. Um, and we found that our 42nd um, sample most closely um, aligns with their data um, on what whiskey profiles should look like. So, um, actually, can we go back one slide? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, so then what this allowed us to do is determine that our ratio um, was um, 360 milliliters of distillate to 8 grams of wood um, scaled up. This is 1.37 kilograms per wood of wood per gallon. Um, and then we can compare this to the traditional um, requirement for wood to distillate ratio um, when using a barrel. Um, which is 1.25 kilograms per gallon. So it is a little bit more, but not significantly. So then the second thing that we did to test our samples was um, run it through a GC machine. Um, we were able to test for ethanol. So um, primarily the purpose of this was to determine um, if we were losing ethanol through um, our process. Um, and what we found is that we did not, our data, um, so the machine we use is from 85 and it hasn't been turned on in a very long time. Um, we were very lucky to get it up and running. So some of our data was a little bit wonky, but removing outliers um, gave us an average ethanol content of 40.8%, which is consistent with what we expected. Um, and then this is our PA, PNID. Um, the main, so originally our design had one reactor um, and didn't incorporate a fil filtration system. Um, what we ultimately decided is that um, based on the flow rate that we chose for our project, which is based on um, the production level of Jack Daniels, um, 50 gallons a minute, um, and they operate 24 hours a day, that we needed to incorporate two reactors to allow um, for emptying and cleaning of the reactor. Um, so you can just switch back and forth so there's no downtime. Um, the other thing that was important was implementation of a filtration system. Through our experimenting, we noticed that there were some solid particulates um, in our affluent, and um, so those need to be filtered out. Then in terms of um, reactor design and sizing, so we determined based on our um, wood to distillate ratio that a 15,000 gallon capacity vessel would be sufficient for seven hours of processing at 50 gallons per minute. Um, as I mentioned before, we do two reactors that you could switch between um, to eliminate downtime. And then we also wanted to implement vessels that were self-emptying. Um, I apologize, these videos I don't think are gonna work. Um, <laughs> um, but basically a self-emptying vessel, it has a, a um, a slanted bottom that has um, a corkscrew type um, thing in the bottom and it pulls all of the solid out and then that can be again moved to um, trucks where it would ultimately be sent to be composted or turned into charcoal. So on to our economic analysis. Um, so the main pieces of process equipment we need for this are the reaction vessel itself a couple very large um, 80,000 gallon storage tanks, which are prevented to allow the oxygen to interact with the um, uh, alcohol solution and create the ethyl acetate and other compounds. Um, we need our uh, two concentric heat exchangers. Um, the non shown here are also the uh, pumps and other small equipment that we would also need. Our um, total equipment capital cost should be around um, $320,000, and uh, we also have a estimate Aspen gave us for a um, total uh, project cost uh, for capital, which is around $4 million. That includes the um, actual construction of the facility, the uh, piping, plumbing, painting, um, uh, pretty much everything. So um, operating costs, we have two main utilities. We have electricity and we have steam, uh, which will sum to around $60,000 per year for those. Um, we are going to need some labor to run this process. Uh, we are going to need, um, we estimate about two workers per shift, um, running on a three shift a day, 24 hours, so seven days a week cycle. Um, and uh, at a rate of $20 an hour, uh, it'll cost around 
$300,000 to pay those uh, two workers per shift. We'll also need a supervisor, and at a $35 an hour rate, that'll add another $300,000 coming to around um, $650,000 or $700,000 per year. Um, Aspen also gave us a estimated maintenance cost for this plant, around 20 grand a year, um, giving us a total yearly operating cost of uh, $750,000. So one thing to uh, note is uh, how we had planned to operate our business as a limited partnership um, is to uh, contract out our services uh, to distillers and sort of append our process onto the end of theirs. And so uh, these costs are based off of um, not integrating uh, like our needs and supplies with theirs at all. I'm sure during the negotiation of some sort of contract uh, that you know maybe their supervisors could oversee our side of the process since it is relatively simple. And so these costs are uh, sort of a completely independent estimation. Yes, as Sean said, these costs are based on a um, production rate of 50 gallons per minute, which is the production rate that Jack Daniels uses. Um, uh, most other distilleries would not be uh, experiencing these high capital costs and be much lower. Um, so, uh, but for this 50 gallon per minute production rate, um, we are uh, going to need our um, raw, unrefined whiskey and our oak barrel chips, both of which are about um, 50 cents per gallon. Um, for, for the oak, that's in terms of like, the ratio of the, what you need per gallon of whiskey. Um, which comes to a yearly, yearly, the yearly raw material cost of around uh, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars each. Um, we uh, expect to be able to sell this product for around two dollars and fifty cents per gallon. Um, this is before uh, bottling, packaging, and distribution. Um, this will not be our end of the business. Um, we focusing solely on this one step, and um, our function would be to. Uh, let the distilleries who already do these uh, bottling operations continue to do so. Um, we expect to take in a yearly revenue for taxes of uh, 37 million. Um, after uh, state and federal tax, it'll be uh, closer to 26 million. And then we intend to charge a 20% licensing fee of that from the distilleries who will be operating our process, giving us about $5 million. So our process is, uh, since it is a relatively simple process, it's very scalable, um, which could be uh, for, uh, technically, uh, for the American Craft Distillers Association, uh, a micro distiller is rated about 100,000 gallons per year of uh, production. And so that's sort of our lower end of the scale. And then Jack Daniels, one of the largest producers, runs at about a million gallons per year. Uh, and so our process would be scalable, ideally, between uh, you know, either end of this slider. Uh, whether it be, you know, you increase reactor volume um, or you use multiple reactors, uh, which, excuse me, would be the uh, actually can like construction and design of the system, uh, could be modular uh, for every contract. Um, some experimental things you would have to determine uh, depending upon the customer desires. Uh, you might need a longer residence time uh, to uh, for depending upon like the char on the oak chips, um, heavier toasted ones will give up their flavor more easily. Um, and uh, uh, and so uh, scaling, the only thing that is harder to scale is pressure uh, because you can't just keep increasing your pump size without blowing out your pipes. Uh, but in that case, you would use uh, smaller uh, uh, extraction reactors in series uh, with, mul with multiple smaller pumps uh, rather than just trying to do all your extraction at once. Uh, and ideally, uh, should our project catch on, uh, we would be able to test, um, uh, this process can be applied to other spirits, like there's a market for like barrel aged wine, gin, rum, etc. cetera. Uh, and so uh, future work would be evaluating our process uh, in regards to other markets. So that is all. We want to uh, give a thanks um, to everyone who helped us with our project, um, including uh, our mentor, Peter Schmidt. Yeah, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, Professors Fluger and Bon Sharif, uh, and our TAs, Zach and Ada. Uh, and then Professor Willie and Rob Egan for fixing the GC machine. So. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you very much.
So, if you have any questions. Did you guys taste it? We made it in the UO lab, so we're really not supposed to. Um, <laughs> I mean, could you, you, so you didn't any, do it, any physical tasting of anything? We haven't work? tasted um, because it's technically not safe. Safe to drink, okay. Yeah. And I believe the alcohol you use is not food grade anyway, right? Just not with it. it was food grade. Yeah, it was food grade. It yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but this, like, if you just smell it, um, just like a qualitative smelling, mm -hmm. it is definitely different. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And it does oh, smell like smells whiskey. Like whiskey. Yeah. yeah. So it's not a machine. It's it's, it's a there's some sense to it. Yeah. Sense yes. Yeah. Uh, how much cheaper it would it be than like, traditionally aged whiskey? So it's kind of hard to estimate just because it's really, really hard to find numbers um, for exact like production and labor costs associated um, with traditional whiskey production. Um, but based on the cost of the wood alone, that like, I don't have a number off the top of my head, but it significantly reduces the cost of production um, just from switching from barrels to wood chips. Yeah, the idea is that you would get this over in uh, like a seven hour production day rather than 30 years. I have several questions. So the first one is that um, what about sending whiskey in space to Aging, right? You probably read this story about it's the Japanese guys that send whiskey to the International Space Station. Uh, I guess that uh, flew under our radar. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm I think sorry. Actually, like, the whiskey is the most expensive that you can buy so far. Makes sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, but my first question is that isn't the fact that we have to age it that make it interesting? Like in, for alcohol in general, so by trying to decrease the time of the process, would it still be like interesting to buy whiskey anymore? Is that the general question for you guys? I mean, I think the goal of this process isn't to make like a two hundred dollar bottle of whiskey. Um, the goal of it is to kind of bring down that that top shelf quality to a like a mid tier, uh, like price pricing point. Like I think the price point at where um, you're worried about the production and where that is a focal point of interest is far beyond what we would end up selling our product. As like somebody who's going out to buy like Jack Daniels, for example, doesn't so much care about how it's produced as opposed to when you're buying like a $200 bottle of whiskey. So it's not really reducing the cost, right? It's more like creating a new brand of whiskey cheaper for people, or more affordable. Yeah, sure. also um, like, let's say you age it for a certain amount of time, let's say 30 years, you age it for 30 years, but we, for example, take off that five years or so, so you still would age it and say, you know, it's aged and you might sell it that way, but you, um, we might reduce your aging uh, time as well. The other thing is too, is due to budget and time constraints, we weren't able to analyze exactly what um, was in our final product, um, but given more time and more resources, uh, it would be interesting to see what's actually in there and then compare that to some um, whiskeys and see where ours actually falls in terms of quality. And I just have a last question regarding the absorbance data. Yeah. You didn't mention neither the wavelengths or what you were looking at. You just talk about aging. What do you mean by aging? If you just a gentleman core, you could just have that like a food core, you know what I mean? So what was the aim of these experiments exactly? Um, it was really hard, again, because of budget constraints. We couldn't go out and buy a bunch of whiskeys to test ourselves. Um, so it was pretty difficult to find um, literature data that specifically spelled out like all of their yeah. numbers we really just were able to find charts and kind of compare um, visually what they were like and what the absorbance data generally trended as. So what other people have done in the past um, is use high pressure liquid chromatography uh, with reference compounds um, but uh, we were able to use a GC machine just because it was in the UO lab uh, we asked around campus, we, no one would let us use their HPLC or GC. Um, and beyond that, purchasing reference compounds uh, to identify exactly what we were looking for uh, is also, we had a hundred dollar budget, like it was uh, not feasible. Uh, and so we went with the data analysis that, you know, worked for us and we uh, were able to kind of find a rate of extraction generally. Okay. Any questions? Um, I'm curious why you decided to like license your or like you know use your pro like sell your process versus just making your own product yourself because it seems like whiskeys are kind of branded by their 
by how they age? Like, did you ever consider making the product as you know your rib fan as whiskey as your? So um, we would not be targeting distilleries who focus on that sort of branding. The idea would be towards distilleries who maybe have a very cheap, low-end product, but produce it in a high volume. Um, and then they could turn that into something that's more refined in terms of taste, maybe not in the sense that it has this like aging or story behind it, but they could also sell it at a higher price point. There's also something to be said for cost. Um, it is... Uh, cheaper uh, in a shorter term uh, to rather than create your own uh, distillation process you're essentially buying your own distillate um, to use it in our process if you put our process on the end of yours um, and so there's that sort of shorter term uh, cost benefit what's average aging of whiskey uh, so probably three to five years, something like that. Most, the most things you'll find on the shelf. Yeah. Um, so there is a legal standard to be called uh, straight whiskey. It has to be aged three years. Um, and so, I mean, we wouldn't be calling our process, uh, we wouldn't be calling our product uh, straight whiskey. Um, but uh, that's, most things you'll find on the shelf that are labeled that way are going to be because it's under the, uh, the Code of Federal Regulations for Alcohol. Uh, tobacco products and firearms. Okay, so you said at, at least three years. So when you use your when you use your prototype, what do you think this would correspond in terms of aging of whiskey in a barrel? I think from our UV spec data. I think the sample. I believe the sample was three years old. Yeah. Uh, compared, like the the um, company had run, but it would be interesting. Definitely interesting to get more data on it. It was just a little bit challenging um, to find really accurate reference. You so you can control your parameters to yeah. target what, let's say, I want to make today 10-year equivalent of, you know, whiskey. Yeah. Whiskey. And that would be the ultimate goal with my testing. Yeah. So you guys used um, uh, oak chips, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is there, did you make it yourself or you bought it? We, we bought, bought them. They're um, heavy toast American oak chips. Okay. Do you think if you use something a little bit smaller, like powder, do you think you can extract more? Yeah, so what we did for our bench top scale process is we actually pulverized the wood chips um, just to be able to get the pressure that we needed in such a small volume. Um, and definitely increasing the surface area for sure increases the extraction, yeah. But there is an issue with uh, using powdered wood chips um, is the amount of pressure you need to push your whiskey through that um, through those wood chips uh, is a lot higher and then your filtration system at the end has to be a lot more fine um, and so that's why we went again that's why we thought uh, we went more for pulverized rather than completely processed okay. what was your pressure what pressure did you push it through we pushed ours on our benchtop scale was 20 bar 20 bar 20 bar which is it's the pump that was already we actually didn't modify that at all it was the pump that was already in the espresso machine what did you guys get this espresso machine? Um, so I've owned it for years, and it's been sitting in the basement of my dad's house, and uh, just figured I just donated it to the project. Right, it's good use. So do you think you can actually sell that actually as a product? Like you know, an espresso, you buy the capsule, you put it, you get your coffee, do you think you can sell it? <laughs> Honestly, so <laughs> someone actually mentioned that exact same thing to us at our uh, poster presentation. at our poster presentation, and I think we were thinking of patenting it <laughs> like I think ultimately what we decided is there's just not enough of a market for it like the cost the investment cost of buying something like that to an individual consumer isn't gonna make making this product any more cost effective for them as opposed to just going out and buying a bottle of whatever they wanted yeah. to drink so my last question is do you think any of the chemicals that is leaching out of the wood can be toxic down the road um, well, so okay, the wood chips that we use are food grade, um, and they're actually intended for use um, of just putting in distillate and sitting. So it wouldn't, it shouldn't change um, in our process, um, especially because our temperatures don't exceed um, any further than they would on a hot day. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much.